Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, you can rest easy. I won't be asking you any questions this morning. You may have some for me at the end of my presentation, though. Um, it is uh, very much an honor to participate in this symposium, and I very much like that this conference is being held at the time it is because my wife and I very much like to visit the Christmas markets. And last night we were busy uh, helping the German economy. So, <laughs> so for my presentation today, I'll be um, addressing quite a few topics. So quite clearly, I'll be just speaking about each one for a couple of minutes. And I'll do my best to try and summarize the current state of understanding about each of these different areas. I want to begin by talking about isoflavones because isoflavones are found primarily only in soybeans. So if you consume a diet that contains soy foods, it is high in isoflavones. If you don't eat soy foods, it is almost completely lacking in isoflavones. And the isoflavones are the reason that soy foods have been the subject of so much research over the past 25 years. And you can see that in Japan, isoflavone intake averages about 30 to 50 milligrams per day, whereas in Germany, it is less than one milligram per day. Isoflavones have a chemical structure that is similar to the hormone estrogen, and you can see this point illustrated on this slide. The primary isoflavone in soybeans is janistein, and it's the isoflavone that has received most of the research attention. Because isoflavones are able to bind to estrogen receptors, they exert estrogen-like effects under certain experimental conditions, and for this reason, they are commonly referred to as phytoestrogens. However, the phytoestrogens or plant estrogens in soy are very different from the hormone estrogen. And in fact, in addition to being classified as plant estrogens, they are also classified as selective estrogen receptor modulators. This is a term that is widely used in the pharmaceutical industry. Examples of selective estrogen receptor modulators include the breast cancer drugs, raloxifene, and tamoxifen. Depending upon the tissue, selective estrogen receptor modulators can have effects similar to estrogen opposite to those of estrogen, and even have no effects in tissues that are affected by the hormone estrogen. And there are many clinical examples indicating that isoflavones and estrogen have very different effects and also very similar effects. So for example, you can see on this slide that both isoflavone, excuse me, that estrogen stimulates vaginal tissue, reduces bone loss in postmenopausal women, stimulates breast tissue, and increases blood clot formation. Isoflavones don't have any of those effects. On the other hand, both molecules alleviate hot flashes, improve endothelial function, and there is speculative evidence that isoflavones like estrogen reduce wrinkles. However, it's important to note that very rarely have anti-estrogenic effects of isoflavones been observed clinically. Now I want to look at the effect of soy foods on cardiovascular disease risk. Soy foods favorably affect a number of markers of cardiovascular disease risk. For example, the protein lowers LDL cholesterol levels, and because soy foods are high in polyunsaturated fat, 
when they replace animal foods in the diet, saturated fat is decreased, polyunsaturated fat is increased, and blood cholesterol levels are also reduced. The protein also modestly lowers blood pressure, both systolic and diastolic blood pressure. And then the isoflavones decrease arterial stiffness and increase endothelial function. So there are many mechanisms by which soy foods may potentially reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. But now let's actually look at the epidemiologic data to see if people who consume higher amounts of soy are less likely to have a coronary event, that is, a fatal or non-fatal heart attack. Three prospective studies have evaluated this relationship. Not surprisingly, all three studies were conducted in Asia. Western populations, in general, consume too little soy for these types of study to have biological significance. You can see in the third column the number of participants in each of these studies. They were quite large. And then you have the number of years the participants were followed, ranging from as little as 2.5 years to as much as 14.7 years. And then you have the number of people in each of these studies that suffered a heart attack. First, let's look at the data for women. And for those of you that aren't familiar with epidemiologic data, if the relative risk is below one, it means that high soy intake reduce risk of having a heart attack. If it's above one, it means that risk was increased. So you can see in Shanghai and China, higher soy consumption was associated with a very robust decrease in the risk of having a heart attack. In Singapore, the risk was only slightly reduced, and that was not statistically significant. The values in the red parentheses represent the 95% confidence intervals. So the data for women look quite good. Somewhat unexpectedly, however, the data for men are not impressive at all. In Shanghai, higher soy consumption was actually associated with an increased risk of heart attack, and there were no protective effects in Shanghai or Singapore. Now, it's not clear to me why these studies show effects are so protective in women, but not men, but it may be because the plant estrogens, the isoflavones, are having effects in women that they're not having effects in men. So at least for cardiovascular disease, these data raise the possibility that soy has gender-specific effects. Now let's move on to breast cancer. This is an area that I'm very much interested in. It was the reason that I entered the field more than 25 years ago. Now, unfortunately, in my opinion, the evidence that adult soy intake reduces breast cancer risk is unimpressive. So I don't think if women consume soy, their breast cancer risk will be reduced. I do think, however, that soy reduces breast cancer risk, but to derive this benefit requires consuming soy very early in life that is, during childhood and or during the teenage years. So let's look at the data. There are animal data in support of this hypothesis, epidemiologic data, and we have a good understanding of why soy is protective. I generally don't show animal studies because I don't think they are much value in gaining insight into the effects of diet on human nutrition. Once in a while, I will show them but only if they support the point I'm trying to make. Here we have the original animal data that is responsible for the hypothesis being proposed 
in 1995 that consuming soy early in life reduces breast cancer risk. Remember, genistein is the main isoflavone or plant estrogen in soy. When genistein is given to adult animals, there is no protective effects. You can see that the number of tumors per rat when genistein is given to adults is 8.2. That's the same number of tumors when no genistein is given to animals. However, when genistein is given to animals when they are three weeks old, for just a couple of weeks, the number of tumors is reduced by 50%. When those same animals are also given genistein during adulthood, tumor, tumor number is reduced by another 50%. So the key is exposure to genistein early in life. And here we have the population studies. Four studies have evaluated the effect of consuming soy early in life on later risk of developing breast cancer. So for these studies, the investigators recruit a group of women without cancer and a group of women with breast cancer. They then interview the women to determine how much, they, how much soy they consumed when they were teenagers. All four studies were involved Asian women. Two studies were conducted in the United States and two in Shanghai. We have the number of participants in each study. And then again, we'll be showing the odds ratio. If the odds ratio is below one, it means that soy is protective. And then in the last column, we have the 95% confident intervals. So higher soy intake during the teenage years was responsible or associated with anywhere from a 28% reduction in the risk of developing breast cancer to a 60% reduction in the risk of developing breast cancer. These are really amazing results. The amount of soy the women consumed during adulthood did not impact these findings. And then finally, we have several proposed mechanisms for why consuming soy early in life is protective. It's clearly due to the isoflavones. They increase cell differentiation. They increase levels of a gene that repairs DNA damage. And they increase expression of estrogen receptor beta and decrease expression of estrogen receptor alpha. So although this hypothesis is speculative because we don't have clinical data in support of it, I strongly recommend that all girls consume one serving of soy per day. It's, uh, soy is easy to incorporate into the diet. It's a nutritious food. Even if future research does not confirm this hypothesis, it certainly makes sense for girls to consume soy foods. Now, although the isoflavones in soy are different from estrogen, concerns have arisen that soy foods may worsen or harm the prognosis of women with breast cancer because of the possibility that estrogen worsens the prognosis of breast cancer. So can soy foods safely be consumed by breast cancer patients? We don't have any clinical studies that have actually evaluated the effects of soy on tumor recurrence or mortality due to breast cancer. So no clinical studies have been conducted to examine those questions. But many studies have evaluated the effects of soy or isoflavones on indicators of, or markers of breast cancer risk. These studies, without exception, show that soy foods do not adversely affect breast tissue. So these more than 50 trials are a very strong argument for the safety of soy foods. But interestingly, the population data not only indicate that soy is safe for breast cancer patients, but actually beneficial for breast cancer patients. So to illustrate that point, I want to present the results of a pooled analysis. That's a combined analysis of three studies. 
the Shanghai Breast Cancer Study, Survival Study, and then two studies in the United States. These studies involved nearly 10,000 women with breast cancer. Half were Chinese, half were Caucasian, half were premenopausal, half were postmenopausal. The women were followed for 7.4 years on average. During that time, 1,200 women died from all causes, 900 women died specifically due to breast cancer, and 1,348 women had a recurrence of their disease. And again, we have the relative risk of having a breast, second breast cancer, a recurrence of their disease, dying from all causes, or dying specifically from best breast cancer. The investigators divided the women into three groups according to the amount of isoflavones they consumed. Just focus your attention on the high isoflavone group. That's the group that consumed at least 10 milligrams of isoflavones per day. So we see the risk of dying from all causes was reduced by 13%. The risk of dying specifically from breast cancer was reduced by 17%, and the risk of having a recurrence was reduced by 25%. And the re reduction in the risk of recurrence was statistically significant. And recognize that for these studies, we're actually comparing the effect of consuming high amounts of soy after a diagnosis of breast cancer with low amounts of soy after a diagnosis of breast cancer. Um, soy foods appear to be slightly more beneficial in women who use the breast cancer drug tamoxifen, slightly more beneficial in postmenopausal women, and slightly more beneficial in women with estrogen receptor negative breast cancer. Interestingly, a Chinese study that was not included in that pooled analysis, it was not one of those three studies, found that women who consumed soy and were on the breast cancer drug, which is an aromatase inhibitor, actually did better than women who were on the drug but did not consume soy. So soy actually enhanced the efficacy of one of the primary drugs used to treat breast cancer. Recently, the World Cancer Research Fund International released their comprehensive report on lifestyle and the survival of breast cancer patients, and they found that there was suggestive evidence indicating that healthy body weight, being physically active, consuming higher amounts of fiber, eating foods containing soy, and decreasing saturated fat intake improve the survival of breast cancer patients. So we've gone from a situation in the mid-1990s where there was concern that soy foods may harm breast cancer patients to the current state of the evidence indicating that soy foods are actually beneficial for breast cancer patients. Now let's look at osteoporosis. There certainly was plenty of reason to speculate that isoflavones may have skeletal benefits because we know that the hormone estrogen reduces bone loss and reduces fractures in postmenopausal women. However, remember isoflavones and estrogen are very different. We do have two prospective epidemiologic studies from Asia showing that women who consume soy foods are about one-third less likely to have a fracture in comparison to women who consume little soy. However, the clinical studies are very unimpressive. Four clinical studies have evaluated the effects of isoflavones on bone mineral density that have been at least two years in duration. One study was conducted in Italy, happened to actually be conducted at the University of Messina. There's a genetic connection, but I wasn't involved with that study. 
um, two studies in the United States and one in Taiwan. You can see the amount of isoflavones that the subjects consumed. Remember that average intake in Japan is about 30 to 50 milligrams per day. So these were very high amounts of isoflavones. The number of participants in each trial is shown in the fifth column, and then you see the results. In the Italian study, there was a very pronounced increase in bone mineral density, but in the other three studies, there was absolutely no effect. So my conclusion at this point is that isoflavones do not affect bone density in postmenopausal women. Now, in the Italian study, the women were osteopenic. That is, they had very low, low bone mineral density. So it may be that in cases where women are at high risk of developing osteoporosis, that isoflavones are very protective. Even though isoflavones may not promote bone health, soy foods provo provide high quality protein, which I think is important for strong bones. The calcium in soy is well absorbed. Soybeans are high in potassium, which promotes bone health. And then it's possible that isoflavones and consumed early in life are beneficial. Hot flashes, this is an area that I've been involved with for quite a few years. I recently was a co-author on a meta-analysis that included 17 clinical trials. So all of these trials had a placebo group and an isoflavone group. Because hot flashes are subjectively determined, that is, women report the number of hot flashes they have in a diary, it's essential to have a placebo group. We only looked at trials that intervened with pills or isoflavone supplements. We didn't look at the effects of trials that intervened with soy foods. It's very hard to do trials, hot flash trials with soy foods because the subjects need to be blinded. That is, they can't know. They need to be unaware of what group they're in. And if you're giving someone tofu, it's hard to disguise that fact. So here we have the uh, results. There were 13 trials that looked at the number of hot flashes per day involving 1,200 women. There were nine trials that looked at how bothersome the soy foods were, or the hot flashes were, except, excuse me, and there were 1,000 women in those trials. So this is a large data set. You see the placebo response. Generally, it's about 25% improvement in the placebo response the effect of isoflavones, and then the effect beyond the placebo effect. So isoflavones reduced hot flash frequency by about 21%, and hot flash severity by about 26%. And in both cases, those findings were highly statistically significant. So in my opinion, the evidence is very consistent, very clear that isoflavones alleviate hot flashes. Now, one thing that we did in, a gen in general, in addition to the general analysis, was to do a sub-analysis looking at, at supplements that provided low amounts of genistein versus high amounts of genistein. Seven trials involving 596 women provided supplements that were low in genistein. Six trials with 600 women provided supplements that were high in genistein. And you can see the high genistein supplements reduced hot flash frequency by more than twice as much as the low genistein supplements. So the key is to make sure that you're consuming isoflavones that provide sufficient amounts of genistein. So overall, the data suggests if a woman consumes about 50 to 60 milligrams of isoflavones per day, and that provides 20 milligrams of isoflavones, hot flashes will be reduced by 50 to 60 percent, and that certainly represents a significant improvement in the overall quality of life if a woman can go from having 10 hot flashes per day down to four or five. 
50 to 6, 50 milligrams of isoflavones is provided by two servings of soy foods. So that would be one cup of soy milk or one half cup of tofu. Cognitive function, this is a very controversial area. Uh, if you're familiar with this literature, you know that uh, several epidemiologic studies have actually found that higher soy intake was associated with a worse cognitive function, an impairment in cognitive function. Now, not all studies have found that association, and the studies that have found a negative association had several design weaknesses. I don't have time to cover all of the uh, data, the clinical or epidemiologic data, so what I would like to do is to just uh, leave you with this statement from a very excellent review that was published earlier in the year. This analysis looked at the animal data, the clinical data, and the epidemiologic data, and they concluded the evidence to date is not sufficient to make any recommendations about the association between dietary intake of soy isoflavones and cognition in older adults. So at this point, we really can't reach any conclusions about whether soy has a beneficial effect, no effect, or a harmful effect on cognitive function. Skin wrinkling. Um, my wife and I have been uh, working together for as long as we've been married, which is 32 years. Uh, she's, uh, her uh, specialty is actually vegetarian nutrition, and I often joke that uh, only when I started to mention that isoflavones may decrease wrinkles did she become interested in my work. <laughs> there are actually quite a few preliminary studies suggesting that isoflavones may improve skin health, including a reduction in wrinkles. But all of the studies listed on this slide have important design limitations. So it's interesting and intriguing but certainly not sufficient to make any conclusions. But I do want to present the results of a study published last year, it's actually a European study, that looked at the effects of isoflavones on wrinkles in 159 postmenopausal women. So it was a very large study. The intervention was 14 weeks in duration. The primary outcome was the wrinkles around the corner of the eye, uh, which in English we refer to as the crow's feet wrinkles. Here we have the design, the different groups of the study. We had a placebo group, and then two groups who received isoflavones. One group received 43 milligrams, the other group received 25 milligrams. So this is actually a very low amount of isoflavones. Even the high group is less than two servings of soy per day, but they were given in pill form. They also consume the carotenoid lycopene, which is found in tomatoes, vitamin C and E antioxidants, and then omega-3 fatty acids. So in very simplified form, what was found was there was a statistically significant decrease in wrinkles. The average decrease in wrinkles was about 10%. But remember, this is only a 14-week study. So in theory, it's possible that a longer intervention would have led to a larger decrease. The more wrinkles, or the deeper the wrinkles were at the beginning of the study, the greater was the benefit in a given woman. And there was a significant increase in the synthesis of collagen, which is a protein produced in the skin. It helps to, to keep the skin elastic and firm. Collagen synthesis decreases with age. The increase in collagen synthesis almost certainly accounts for the decrease in wrinkles. Now, if you recall the design of the study, it's very obvious that you can't reach any specific conclusions about the contribution that isoflavones made because there were other biologically active components in the mixture. However, these other components do not affect collagen synthesis, which was the reason wrinkles were reduced. And the authors of, of the study actually indicated at a public scientific meeting 
that when isoflavones were removed from the preparation, the benefits for, were lost. So I think this is a very exciting area of research. Uh, prostate cancer, um, no surprise, prostate cancer rates are low in soy food consuming countries. These kind of observations helped fuel interest in this area more than 25 years ago. So I wanted to present the results of a meta-analysis of 14 epidemiologic studies, a combination of case control and prospective studies. We're comparing high soy intake with low soy intake. When all 14 studies were included in the analysis, high soy intake was associated with a 26% reduction in the risk of developing prostate cancer. But what was interesting, that sub-analysis revealed that soy reduced risk of prostate cancer by 50% 50 in Asian men, but there was no effect in Western men. Does this mean that soy isn't protective against prostate cancer in Western men? Absolutely not. What it means is that soy intake by Western populations is too low to exert biological effects. There's intriguing evidence that soy may not only help to reduce the development of prostate cancer, but may help prostate cancer patients. A number of studies have looked at the effects of soy on prostate cancer patients. Specifically, they have looked at prostate-specific antigen and I would like to present the results of just one study. This is a little bit biased because I've, I'm showing one of the more interesting results and results that support the potential benefits of soy. So this is a very small study, 10 patients, a pilot study. All of the men were unsuccessfully treated for their disease, surgery, or, surgery and radiation, and in some cases, a chemical castration. We knew the treatment was ineffective because PSA levels were rising. Nine men consumed three cups of soy milk per day. One man consumed soy in the form of a variety of soy snacks. So all of the men had prostate cancer. I'm going to show you the results of just two men. Here we have one patient. PSA levels are rising, indicating the treatment is ineffective. Soy milk is consumed, and we see PSA levels decrease for about two years, which is really quite impressive because this patient was out of conventional medical options. Next patient is even more impressive, rising PSA levels, soy milk, levels stay down for the entire length of the study. Now, no man is going to consume soy well, prostate cancer patients will. No, no healthy men will consume soy if they think it's going to make them more like women, cause them to be more feminine. And I can assure you the clinical studies show there's no effect of soy on testosterone levels, no effect on estrogen. Men make estrogen. Older men make more estrogen than older women. And there's no effect on sperm or semen. Um, there's no effect of soy on thyroid function in people with a normal functioning thyroid. If you have, um, if you're hypothyroid and you're taking medication, you can consume soy foods. There is one study that raises some questions. This was a study that looked at the effect of soy in subclinical hypothyroid patients. So you have normal thyroid function low thyroid function, and then a category in between those. Only one study looked at this issue, a crossover study, eight weeks per phase, eight weeks washout, 60, pati 60 patients, most of them were female. One group consumed 30 grams of soy protein that provided two milligrams of isoflavones, so very low isoflavones. The other, one, the other group consumed soy that provided 16 milligrams of isoflavones. What they found was that about 10% of the people consuming the high isoflavone protein progress from subclinical to overt hypothyroidism. So 10% in six months, that would be 20% per year. The 
expected rate of progression was 5.6% per year based on other studies. So that means that in this one study, soy increased the risk of progressing to overt hypothyroidism by about threefold. Again, it's just one study. And interestingly, in all of the patients, both those that progressed and those who did not progress, soy dramatically, dramatically reduced blood pressure, 141 down to 134, 77 down to 72. It reduced insulin resistance and it reduced inflammation. And all these findings were statistically significant. So in the vast majority of subclinical hypothyroid patients, soy is very beneficial. And then finally, does soy affect puberty? This question has arisen because, as I'm sure many of you recognize, of the age at which puberty begins is decreasing. So girls are beginning to menstruate earlier and earlier in life. And you can see this point illustrated here. There's two European countries, but in all cases around the world, girls are beginning to menstruate earlier in life. And you can see in Korea, between 1920 and 1985, girls went from menstruating beginning at 16.9 years to 13.8 years. Now, one of the problems with beginning puberty earlier in life is that there is an increased risk of breast cancer. However, we've already talked about the fact that early soy intake seems to reduce breast cancer risk, so you wouldn't think that soy would affect puberty. Nevertheless, because one theory is that the reason that girls are beginning puberty early in life is because of exposure to environmental estrogens, the question has arisen as to whether soy affects puberty. So I was involved with a study that looked at the effect of soy on 327 uh, Seventh-day Adventist girls. Seventh-day Adventist is a religious denomination that promotes a vegetarian diet, so they're high soy consumers. We use current soy intake as a representative of past soy intake. And let me just show you, you can see that there was a range of soy intake. 20% of the girls consume soy less than once per week. 20% of the girls consume soy at least four times per day. So excellent population to study. And we found absolutely no relationship. If you look on the left, it's girls, the girls who consume soy less than once per week. On the right, girls that consume soy at least three times per day. And the age at which girls began menarche did not change. So my recommendations, intake recommendations, are for children one serving per day, six to 10 grams of protein, about 25 milligrams of isoflavones, and for adults two to three servings per day, I'd say the upper limit is about 25 grams of soy protein, not because more than that is harmful, but simply because you're not supposed to place too much emphasis on any one food, no matter how healthy. Thank you for your attention.